If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. We're, we're kind of continuing what we uh, started last Sunday night. And, it, and I wanted to point out some things. This isn't a... <clears throat> This isn't a sermon like, I, I don't know, I never figure out what I, what I do really, but this is more of a teaching lesson. I'm just going to point out some things that, that you probably are aware of, but just want, want to really, really bring your attention to them, and that way maybe help you in your own reading of the Scripture. Uh, but Luke chapter 13. And for those of you this morning that were listening to me, I, I was telling a story about Basil Overton and the fellow that, that uh, took him to, to have that religious discussion with, with the three men. I didn't mention my friend's name. His name's Sonny Owens. And uh, I'm asking for your prayers for Sonny tonight. I, I saw this, this afternoon, I got a message this afternoon, this morning while he was preaching uh, he passed out, and they had to rush him to the hospital, and I don't know anything other than that. But remember, remember Sonny in your prayers. Oh, Sonny is a, he's a great fella, great fella. And certainly hoping for the best on him. Uh, Luke chapter 13 is where we're going to start. Now, remember last week, we, we looked at a couple of verses in 54 and 55 where Jesus says the, the Jewish people... And, of course, this is true of everybody, but the Jewish people uh, had little uh, clues as to how to predict the weather. And we, we even talked about how they were pretty good, like we can be on short-term forecasts, and like all of history, we're not real good on long-term forecasts. And what we did last Sunday night was we looked at that passage, and then we backed up at, at the preceding uh, teachings of Jesus and we saw that there's no doubt part of what he's talking about is, is the need to prepare for the coming judgment. But one of the other things that I pointed out was that he was also talking about something that was going to happen, uh, you know, fairly close in the future and their need to prepare for that and, and maybe how to avoid it. And I, and I dealt with Luke chapter 13, and you, you, it's a passage, uh, Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. It's a passage that is often cited in bulletins, you know, what must I do to be saved? And we have all of our little verses that most of us, uh, and probably need to go back to that, but most of us growing up churches of Christ knew, just automatically knew. And Luke 13 was often cited either, it still is in bulletins or in sermons about, you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And it's, it's perfectly okay to, to imp, use that verse in that way because repentance is obviously something taught throughout the entire Bible uh, that we need to do, and it's not just a one-time thing. Uh, as we know, it's something that we need to do on a regular basis. But if you look at the context and what Jesus is saying in Luke 13... He's talking about they're going, unless they change their attitude and change their way of doing things, they were going to die a violent death. And so they needed to repent of some things. Now, I know that probably comes as, as a new way of looking at this passage uh, for some of you, but I want you to hear me out on it. I want you to follow along. And I'm going to bounce around for a few verses and just call your attention to something that, that's very much uh, in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus has quite a bit to say about this. Uh, for instance, and, and what I'm talking about, and, and let me make myself as clear as possible. What I'm talking about is the destruction of Jerusalem, which takes place in A.D. 70. So about 40 years after, you know, Jesus is, is among the Jews uh, and after he's crucified and ascends back to heaven, uh, Jesus has this destruction of Jerusalem on his mind. He, of course, is a prophet, and so he can speak of, of things to come. And a lot of times when we think of prophets in the, in the Bible, we tend to think of them speaking long-term prophecy, and they do that, but they also oftentimes speak short-term prophecy, and they also speak a whole lot of conditional prophecy. And so what Jesus is saying here is this is going to happen unless you repent. Now if they repented, they could have prevented 
some of the things that was going to happen in A.D. 70. Uh, now what happens, and let me go a little bit further, and you, I know all of you know this, but in A.D. 70, actually a couple of years prior to that, the, the Jewish people revolted against Rome, and, and Rome sent their massive armies uh, down into Judah, surrounded the city of Jerusalem, and ended up wiping out the population that was, that was captured within, within the city. And just to show you how people obviously don't always think like they ought to think, one of the things that we know that took place is here's this massive Roman army surrounding the city of Jerusalem, and here are these band of Jewish people uh, inside the city fighting against each other. There was three different factions fighting against each other rather than at least trying to work together to, to fend off the Romans or to, to, to come to peace with them in some way and, and save their own lives. It, it, it's a, one of those uh, truly sad facts in history. But the destruction of Jerusalem is on Jesus' mind quite often. Uh, you'll remember uh, in Matthew chapter 23, at the end of Jesus' scathing sermon, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. He goes through all of that, all of the hypocrisy. But at the end of it, and that's something we, we need to keep in mind, that here Jesus is preaching this, this really hard sermon, but we see that it is a sermon that is motivated by love because in verse 37, oh, by the way, verse 36, he, he starts talking about they're going to reap the results of their sins. Verse 36, truly I say to you, all these things will come upon you in this generation. So a short-term prophecy. Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that's, that kills the prophet and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under wings, and you would not. Uh, see, your house has left you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again till, I, till you say, Blessed is who, who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, if you flip back over to Luke chapter uh, 19, and I would like you to see this, because you know, I don't know how aware you are that a lot of the, the passages in Scripture are dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem and not, not the end of the world. But in Luke 19, verse 41, And when he drew near, so after he preaches this scathing sermon, I think this is two separate occasions, he's riding on this donkey and he's, and he's sitting there and he's looking over the city of Jerusalem. And it says he, he, looked, he saw the city and he wept over it saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. So part of the reason they're going to be destroyed is their rejection of Jesus. But it's not just the rejection and crucifixion of Jesus. It's their rejection of his teaching about how they needed to repent. Now you just think about this. How would listening to Jesus... Now obviously Jesus is interested in saving souls, right? He's obviously... That's what he came here for. But he's also here to give abundant life in the here and now, not just in the life to come. And, and so you think about, okay, the Jewish people have developed this, this terrible animosity towards the Roman Empire. What did Jesus say to the Jewish people that would have helped them change their attitude and prevent them being destroyed as a nation? How about love your enemy? How about do good to those who mistreat you? And, and we all know that, that passage where Jesus says, if your enemy compels you to go one mile, not really a mile, but one mile, what are you supposed to do? Go to. Go to. Now where does that come from? That comes from the Roman law that says, okay, if a Roman soldier is on any kind of uh, official business, if he wants to stop somebody on the side of the road and make them carry his pack, then they have to do it. But, to be fair, they had mile markers, 
and, and that person would only, could only be compelled to go to the next mile marker. And Jesus says, now, don't, let your attitude, don't let your enemies get you down. In fact, go above and beyond your service to them. Do more than is expected. Get their attention by being kind. I, I remember uh, uh, Wayne, Wayne Kilpatrick, great preacher down in Homewood in Birmingham, and I'm sure he's not the first one to say this, but uh, he just did such a magnificent job describing this. He said, can you imagine a Roman soldier stopping uh, a Jewish peasant one day and saying, here, I want you to take my, uh, my, my burden, I want you to carry it. And, and, the, and the Jewish peasant, you now typically most of us, if we're out working in a field, we certainly don't want to have to stop and be forced to do something we don't want to do. But he says, what if this Jewish peasant says to the Roman soldier, well, I'll be more than happy to help you. Isn't it a beautiful day? Let me, let me take that pack. Is there anything else you want me to take? And he says, here goes this Jewish peasant walking along, and the Roman soldier starts keeping his eye on him because he says, this guy's crazy, and he's plotting to kill me. And the Jewish peasant is walking along, and he says, I tell you, the Lord has blessed us with a beautiful day. Weather's been nice, hadn't it? Uh, where are you from? And the Roman soldier kind of hesitates, and he finally says, well, I heard that's a pretty place. I, do you have a wife and kids back home? And, and, and you go along, and this, this, this Jewish peasant just takes this cheerful attitude of being forced to do something by the Romans rather than being bitter. And they finally come to that mile marker, and the Roman soldier says, here, let me have my bag back. And the Jewish peasant says, I'm just enjoying walking. Let's, let's go a little bit further. Now, can you imagine if they had adopted that attitude, how much better the relationship between the Jewish people and the Roman Empire could have been? Instead of being filled with animosity and bitterness and, and ready to revolt at all times. And I, we all understand the importance of freedom. And, and we can understand a little bit about the Jews wanting their freedom. But the Roman Empire is pretty massive. And the Roman Empire had already granted the Jewish people more freedom than they had most other conquered people. And they would have probably granted them even more freedom if the Jewish people responded in the way that Jesus says, love your enemy. If your enemy compels you to go one mile, go two. If they had adopted that attitude. But no, they don't do that. And so Jesus knows what's coming because he sees this animosity, sees this bitterness in the Jewish people, and, and he's warning them of it. And, and then he tells what's going to happen in, in a form of a parable, chapter 20, verses 9 through 18. I'm not going to read that to you, but it's, it's the story where Jesus says there was a landowner or a vineyard owner, and, and he goes off and he leaves his vineyard in charge of other people. And, and when it's time to col you know, collect your money or collect your fruit, he sends somebody and, and they mistreat him. And, and he does this again and again. And finally he sends his son. And these, these hired laborers rise up and kill his son. Now what Jesus says, what do you think that landowner's going to do? He's going to bring down his wrath on those wicked uh, vineyard workers and killed. All of this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. I want you to look at one more, one more thing, then we're going to get back to Luke 13. In Luke 23, even when Jesus is being led to the cross, verse 26, and as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind him. And there was following him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him, but turning to them. Now this is Jesus, you know, on his way to the cross, having stumbled, and they, they make this guy carry the cross. But Jesus turns to this, this mob of people behind him that is, that is crying and sad that he's going to die. And he says to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the, and, and the breasts that never nursed. And then they will say to the mountains, that's talking about A.D. 70. 
okay? Ladies, you're crying for me and what's happening to me, but there's going to come a time in which women are going to wish they didn't have children. If you don't understand that context, go read Matthew 24 where he talks about that because here's what's going to happen. If you're pregnant or if you have a small child and the Roman army surrounds you, it's really hard to get away. And your child is also in grave danger. And you're going to be wishing that you didn't have a child and have to live through such a terrible time. So anyway, that's, that's the setting. And that's what I want you to, to go in and understand. A lot of people look at Matthew 24 and, and Mark 13, you know, where Jesus talks about uh, there's wars and rumors of war and all that stuff. And they make it about the end of the world. That's butchering what the scripture is saying. What the scripture is talking about, and Jesus said quite a bit about it, is the destruction of Jerusalem, all of which could have been avoided had they listened to Jesus. Now, Luke 13, after Jesus says, No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In verse 6, And he told this parable, A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why, use it? why, why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year until I dig around it, put manure on it. Then I shall bear fruit next year. Uh, then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. So here's, here's, the, here's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about Israel. Now, fig trees, I don't know when this tree was planted. I, I, maybe it had just been planted three years, but I think it had been there longer because anybody knows in that part of the world that a fig tree after it's planted doesn't start bearing until it's about three years old. So he wouldn't have shown up to expect fruit the first year. But anyway, he shows up one year, no fruit. Shows up the second year, no fruit. Shows up the third year, no fruit. What do you do when you got a tree that's not bearing fruit? Now, folks, let me tell you something. I know Israel is, is viewed as the promised land. <laughs> it's the land flowing with milk and honey. But when you find a good spot of soil, you have found something rare in most of Israel. Now, there's parts of it you can grow a whole lot of wheat. But here, here especially around Jerusalem, south of there, nothing grows. But just around, the, around the city of Jerusalem, if you find a good piece of ground, it's a rarity. And, and here's a garden. or Here you are, a landowner, and you don't have much land to begin with. But one of the prized possessions of people that could afford it and people that had land that, that would uh, allow for this is a garden spot. And in that garden spot, folks, in that garden spot, you had your vegetables, but you also had your fruit trees and maybe even had a shade tree. Usually it's fruit tree uh, used for uh, fruit in because you just don't have much space. And so here you have this tree and it's taking up ground. Is not doing what it's supposed to do. Now, there's a great lesson in this, isn't it? Uh, because you see, what's that fig tree supposed to do? It's supposed to bear figs. That's just what it's supposed to do. And what were God's people supposed to do? And and and, I'm not, and I don't want us to ever sound anti-Jewish because God's people of any age and of any race. <laughs> have been guilty of this at one point or another. But here are the Jewish people that have been blessed by God and they have a favored position with Him. They had the law, they had the prophets, they had so much going for them. They had the temple, they had the sacrifices, they had all of these things that were a special blessing to them that gave them more knowledge and clear knowledge about God than anybody else in the world. So they had a favored position. Now what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to be kind, loving people. Now, you, we all know this. Now Jesus, somebody asked him what the 
the greatest commandment was and then and also what the second greatest commandment was and he says okay here's here's it here's the law summed up love god love your neighbor as yourself and then of course the guy wants to justify himself and say who is my neighbor and so jesus tells that story but anyway it's 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 really it's you know there's 613 commandments but what are they all about loving god and loving your neighbor and by the way, that's still what religion is about, isn't it? That's still the basis of it. Now, that's what God has these people in, in a favored position. They were supposed to produce love. They were supposed to be a society that other people looked at and says, we want to know about the God that created such a people. That's Isaiah 2. They were supposed to be the kind of people that nations would flock to them and learn the ways. And then, and in learning their ways about how they treat their fellow man and how they treat their neighbor and how they treat the poor and how they do all of this, that, that nations were going to flock into, uh, into Jerusalem and say, well, tell us that and that will lead to knowledge about God. Tell us about this God who, who gives you such wisdom. But what did he do? They traded in a relationship with God for legalism. They made the law an oppressive thing. And then they made themselves hypocrites by making the law oppressive. If you don't know what I'm talking about, read Matthew 23. They, they would stand and make long prayers, and when they got through, they'd go out and beat a widow woman out of her house. They did things to be seen to be religious, but they found ways. They, they, they had all these rules and regulations. By the way, the 613 is a whole lot, but by the time the Jewish leadership got through with them, they had so many laws, nobody could keep up with them. But they even had these little loopholes, self-created loopholes where they could where they could lie to somebody by saying, okay, if I swear by the temple, then I, I, if I, I don't have to keep my promise, but if I swear by the gold of the temple, I don't know how you get to that point. I mean, read Matthew 23. It's right there for you. You've got to keep your word. If you swear by the gold of the temple, you swear by the temple, you can break your word. Nonsense. Hypocritical. So they enjoyed a favored position, but they didn't produce what they were supposed to produce. And that's good works, a relationship with God, and a good relationship with people. Now, another thing that this lesson points out, this little parable points out, is that we can never give in to Dead Sea mentality, and you know what it is. It's take, 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 and never give back. Because the Jordan River flows in, and there's an, another couple little tributaries flow into the Jordan River, and, and it just sucks all that water in, and it ends up being poisoned because nothing goes out. And we all know that there are people like that, right? There are people that have this terrible sense of entitlement where they always expect others to do for them, and they demand that others do for them, but they never feel any sense of obligation <laughs> to do for others. So here's this tree that's using up nutrients, using up sunshine, using up fertilizer, taking up space and producing nothing. And God doesn't want us to be like that. But there's something else that this little story tells us, and that is God is a very patient God. We know that, right? You know, I... I, I I'm a, tend to confess my faults to you. Uh, Chad, you're right. We don't do that nearly enough in your prayer this morning. We don't confess our faults uh, nearly enough to each other. Uh, but I do quite a bit, and I'm sure you get tired of hearing about my faults. But if I were to get real specific, I'm glad God let me live to be 21 years old. Does anybody, can anybody relate? Because if I'd have stood in judgment before 21, 
I'm glad God was patient and gave me another chance. Because here's what happens. This tree is about to be cut out and the vine, vineyard worker says, let's give it one more year. Let's, let's help it out. Let's bless it a little bit. Let's see if it does anything. And so we see that God is patient. He, the, 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 the vineyard owner says, okay, we're going to do that. The garden owner, we're going we're gonna to give it one more year. And all of us better be glad God gave us one more year to get things right. Because I think most of us can relate to, we won't admit it, but we realized that there was a time where we definitely were headed for hell. But were it not for the patience and the grace of God, that's where we would have been. But there's another lesson, and this is closing. <coughs> giving you time back by the way y'all should be very proud of me this morning you know last week i was still thinking 8 15 and 9 15 so i preached to 10 15 because that's what i was thinking this morning I, I drew a little clock on my hand and, and put 10 i had the hour hand 10 on 10 so i knew when to quit and i did pretty good but i'm giving you some time back tonight but anyway here's what we need we need to understand God gives us a second chance. And we certainly better latch on to it when it comes. Because there is a final day of reckoning. Because if that end of that year, if that tree hadn't started producing, it's going to be cut down. That was true of Israel during the days of Jesus. They had all of these warnings, all this teaching of Jesus, that could have saved them physically and saved them spiritually. And they didn't listen. And because of that, they brought misery upon themselves, and for many of them, no doubt, an eternal life apart from God because they didn't seize the chance when they had it. If there's anyone that needs to respond to the invitation, we invite you to come as we stand and sing together.